When diving into analyzing TrackMan data, it is easy to feel as though you are just drifting through space searching for answers that just don't seem to be there. The point of this video is to take a deeper look into one of the player development systems I have created to help make all this complex information more easily accessible. But before we jump into this, welcome back to another video guys. If you're new here and you're a coach, player, or trainer interested in learning more about the practical applications of data-driven baseball, you've come to the right place. Join the movement now by clicking the subscribe button down below for more weekly baseball animations. So interpreting TrackMan data, this is a topic that we've talked about before on this channel, and it's one that will most likely be tackled again and again. When analyzing thousands of data points, how do I begin interpreting this information and what actually is important? This is a complex issue, and if you spend all of your time simply staring at the numbers, you'll drive yourself insane. It may seem like a battle between you and the data, an impossible mountain to climb, unless you begin to use your brain to create systems to make this whole process easier. In this video, we will jump into an example of a system I have created to help analyze pitchers. These two pages are an example of a post-action report that is created after every single one of our pitchers' outings on our game map, which can be spit out and printed automatically within about five minutes of the completion of each game. Now, before we jump into it, I just want to clear one thing up. No, this was not a single outing from one of our players. It's a collection of data across multiple outings from an individual to help fully illustrate what this report looks like. Now, let's jump into breaking this report down. To me, it can be split up into five separate categories. The first being a general summarization of the pitch data. This is all of the tabular information on the top left. It features all of your simple outfits from TrackMan. The velocity section should be pretty straightforward. You have a brief overview of the minimum, average, and maximum velocities broken down by pitch type. And this information can truly be used to make sure there is proper 3D separation of these pitches. We talked about the ideal velocity difference of each pitch type in a previous video. I'll put a link to that down below. Next is going to be your spin data. This information is a little less understood generally. We've covered all of these topics on the channel before, so I'll leave more links down below in the description. But this average spin rate figure tells me a lot about a guy. It may lead me in one direction when attempting to create a new breaking ball, as well as telling me where in the zone the pitcher should throw. Lastly in this section is the tilt information. This section explains why each pitch is moving the way they do, and they can also give you good benchmarks for where you may be wanting to work on a pitch. Next up is one of the most important sections to me, but also generates the most confusion, the velocity and horizontal and vertical movement charts. All of these factors in the table lead into what is being displayed here on the right. But here is an easy to read graph that explains exactly the effects that the pitcher is putting on the ball in order to make it move. Each color represents a different pitch. And here you can really begin to dive into these pitch design ideas. What does the spread between the two edges of this fastball tell me? Is one of these movement profiles more effective than the other? Should the changeups be more spread out from the fastball or should it overlap with the same movement profile? Will the slider be more or less effective if we create more horizontal movement or cut? All of these questions don't have a specific yes or no answer. That's for you to find out. Is your goal to have three distinct movement patterns that tunnel really well and split at the end? Are there specific movement patterns that are quantifiably better than other ones at each relative velocity? Or can you use previous data to determine which movement profile has garnered the most success for this athlete in the past? All of these ideas are valid, but which produces the best results? That's for you as a coach to find out. I have my take on this matter, and if you'd like to see that in a future video, leave a comment down below. Our next section is going to be the Pitcher Controlled Results Table, and you'll notice that this isn't your typical box score. You don't have walks and strikeouts or even hits on here. That's because in this particular report, I'm looking for how well this guy executed his stuff, not based on how the hitters hit or the umpires called the game. This gives us more general information on how the pitcher actually did, starting with pitch count. How well did the pitcher mix his stuff? Were they called balls or strikes? Next, and arguably more important, which pitches did he make batters swing at the most often, and how many times did they swing and miss? You can see here that this athlete's changeup forced 10 swings throughout these outings. Of the 17 times it was thrown, and of those 10 swings, batters swung and missed 70% of the time. To me, this is an indicator that this is a successful pitch for this athlete. Lastly, what percentage of pitches were in the zone? With your secondary stuff, especially one that has more swing and miss potential, you may not always be chasing a high number in this category. However, 
Commanding the fastball for strikes is an important aspect of the game. This athlete did well in these outings, hitting the trackman zone 51% of the time. To put this into perspective, the MLB average zone percentage across all pitches was 47% in 2018, so this is right around that margin. Next is just going to be our pitch locations chart. This is also pretty straightforward, but can tell you a lot about a pitcher's outing. For example, you can see that this athlete threw the majority of his sliders low and on his glove side, mostly out of the zone. His changeup was mostly low and arm side, and his fastball, as we mentioned earlier, was in the zone pretty consistent. The next chart is a hard hit summary that details where pitches were hit in the zone classified by their exit velocity. The image is a little difficult to read, so the exit velocities between 85 and 90 miles per hour are in gray, 90 to 95 are in yellow, 95 to 100, which are classified as hard hit, are in orange, and 100 plus is in red. This was created to help further the conversation with players who would come back to the dugout in between innings after giving up a nuke who claimed that they hit their spot. It's no longer a valid excuse. Oftentimes you may hear that, and when you go and check the report you see a big red dot straight down the middle. It's just another tool to keep guys accountable. The last portion of this report includes release point information. The top graph illustrates how high off the ground and how far left and right from the center of the rubber the ball is released. The bottom graph tells me how high off the ground and how far out in front, or their extension, the ball is released. To me, the top graph is going to be the more important one, because this is what a hitter is going to see. This athlete does a pretty good job releasing each pitch from a similar slot. You like to see all of these colors stacked on top of one another. The extension graph on the bottom just helps paint another picture on how an athlete is releasing the ball. If their extension is severely different between a couple different pitch types, this may be an indicator that they are manipulating the body too much to try and create certain movement patterns with their pitches, which could be picked up by hitters. This athlete does a pretty good job of both of those things. However, if we check another athlete's graphs, you will see that this athlete actually releases the ball from three separate points for each of his three pitches. Now, this is not the end of the world. If this pitcher already throws junk and is getting hitters out, this is just something to note and hold on to. But if you're going through your fall scrimmages, and your hitters let you know that it's really easy to see what's coming out of the hand, and he's getting shelled consistently, this may be something you want to work on fixing. Like everything in the player development process, decisions are made on a player by player basis. So what's the secret formula? I've put together good systems to visualize my data, but how do I begin to apply it? The problem is, there really isn't one correct way to go about this. I have my ideas, but they may differ from yours. Each set of eyes may look at the same set of tools differently. Looking at the same data, two coaches may think two very different things. And that's alright, as long as you have a reason to back up the decision you're making. There is one thing that I know we can all agree on, and that is that the increase in the usage of data-driven player development can only aid in this process. We are making better informed decisions quicker and achieving desired results faster than we ever have before. The point of this video was to help illustrate a tool I use regularly to help break down a massive database into easier to manage chunks, and a brief intro on how I apply that information. If you're interested in hearing more or seeing me go through an example of a full breakdown like this one, let me know in the comment section down below. But anyways guys, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video or just want to support the channel, please leave a like. Comment down below any questions or suggestions for a future video, and subscribe for more weekly baseball animations posted every Wednesday.